Dalam sesi mengadap tersebut, saya telah menyerahkan warkah peletakan jawatan saya sebagai Perdana Menteri who will be Malaysia's next Prime Minister. Muhyiddin Yassin has resigned, but stays on as caretaker MP PM. Experts tell ST Singapore is on track to further its restrictions this week thanks to high vaccination rates. And the first panda born in Singapore needs a name, so let us know if you have any ideas. It's 5.30pm here in Singapore. You're watching The Big Story. I'm Harian Tudiman, live in the Straits Times newsroom. Remember to subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. After a tumultuous 18-month rule, Muhyiddin Yassin has finally admitted defeat and resigned as Malaysia's Prime Minister. But he will remain in a caretaker capacity until his successor is appointed. Speaking to Malaysians in a televised address after an audience with the King at the palace, Mr Muhyiddin said he has acted in accordance to the federal constitution and tendered his resignation. I have accepted the Yang Maha Mulia. Sri Paduka Baginda Yang Di-Pertuan Agong pada jam 12.30 tengah, tengah hari tadi di Istana Negara. Dalam sesi mengadap tersebut, saya telah menyerahkan warkah peletakan jawatan saya sebagai Perdana Menteri dan seluruh jemaah menteri di bawah perkara 434 Perlembagaan Persekutuan Disebabkan saya telah kehilangan kepercayaan majoriti ahli Dewan Rakyat. Ini bermakna saya dan seluruh ahli jemaah menteri telah meletakkan jawatan. Mr Muhyiddin also said he hopes a new government can be appointed swiftly so that the administration will not be disturbed. He also stressed his confidence that Malaysia will exit this pandemic crisis very soon, reassuring Malaysians that his cabinet has ordered more than enough vaccines and if the vaccination program goes well, they will get vaccinated by the end of October. The monarch will now determine who can command the majority of the 222 strong legislature where two seats are currently vacant. For a closer look, Malaysia Bureau Chief Shannon Teo joins us live from Kuala Lumpur. Welcome back to the show, Shannon. For a start, Shannon, what are the powers of a caretaker PM? And will Mr Muhyiddin's former cabinet ministers be part of this government? Well, I think we heard what the Prime Minister has to say. The entire cabinet has uh, resigned, they've vacated the officers. But the king has asked the prime minister, just Tan Sri Muhyiddin alone, to remain as a caretaker prime minister. So it's just himself. I think if you can recall um, a bit of deja vu, but 18 months ago, the same thing happened when uh, Tun Dr. Mahade resigned as prime minister. The entire cabinet had to leave their offices, had to put down their tools, but Mahade was still allowed to continue as a caretaker prime minister. Now. The other question, what can a caretaker prime minister do? What powers does, does he have? Well, if you recall, Mahade also then uh, launched Malaysia's first COVID-19 stimulus package while in a caretaker capacity. Now, that kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a gray area because you're not supposed to, by convention, not supposed to uh, put out any new policies if you're in a caretaker position. But back then, that uh, package of stimulus, uh, uh, ideas and proposals was already uh, developed by the finance ministry. The launch date was already set. He just went out there and announced it. So in, in the same way, Tan Sri Muhyiddin now can continue existing policies, policies which are which have already been decided by the government. It just happens that it, it was his government, so it, it, they are also still his policies. Legally, though, there's no such thing as a caretaker or interim prime minister. The, the constitution is silent on, on what these terms mean. What we do understand is, of course, this is kind of an understanding between the king and the prime minister saying that you are a placeholder. We need to have a prime minister. We can't operate in an environment where there is no government. And so you, you, you are, you please stay there until I can appoint a successor. Now, the other 
time when there is a caretaker prime minister in most parliamentary systems is when there is an election. When parliament is dissolved, until an election can be called, there will the, the existing cabinet remains as in a caretaker role. So that kind of tells you what where the convention comes from and, and what kind what is the extent of uh country Muhyiddin's powers right now. And Shannon, how long can Mr. Muhyiddin stay as caretaker PM uh, before a permanent successor is eventually found? Again, the law textbooks are silent on this. There is, the, the king did not mention how long. Uh, there is no such thing as a, a, a limit to how long a prime minister can stay, obviously. So since there is no such term as caretaker prime minister in, in the constitution, so no one really knows how long. Obviously, the king will have to decide at some point whether it is tenable to continue with just a caretaker government or does he have to make some kind of decision obviously the decision is that you have to appoint a new prime minister and failing which you have to dissolve uh, parliament and we have to go for elections now the the thing is here that again if we if we come back to this uh, convention of an election in malaysia an election must be called uh, within 60 days of the dissolution of parliament so that kind of gives you a rough kind of time frame what do we mean by uh, how long can a caretaker stay on for if it were an election situation it would be 60 days so you you're you are working around that sort of convention but in reality there is nothing to stop uh, muhyiddin from serving as caretaker prime minister for as long as the king wants right so still no clear successor, but a few names have been bandied about. Uh, we have former Deputy Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob, there's veteran lawmaker Tengku Razali, Hamza, and of course opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim. Shannon, how do you rate their chances becoming the next PM? Well, I want to make sure I'm on site with whoever becomes the new PM, so I'm afraid to, to offend anyone here. But if you look at the facts that we have at hand, um, Anwar Ibrahim has been trying to become Prime Minister for a very long time. Even when his Pakatan Harapan were in government uh, and, and then Mahade resigned, he still couldn't bring the numbers together to support him. He couldn't get a majority. Last September, he said he had a majority and it didn't turn out to be true. Uh, his consistently repeated this message that he has the numbers, but it just has never happened for him. So many people have doubts. Many people have doubts about whether he can pull through uh, until, I mean, at, at any point before the next election, after an election, maybe he will have more MPs. But at this point, at this level of support, people think it's very tough for him. Most analysts kind of put him as uh, the dark horse. So it's between these two unknown names that you mentioned, the current deputy prime minister, uh, oh well, the outgoing Deputy Prime Minister Ismail Sabri and Tengku Zorizali, who seems to be some kind of uh, compromise candidate. As far as we know, up to now, uh, no agreement has been struck. Amno is still split. And until, uh, uh, well, obviously, until some someone can come up with at least 111, um, the, the, the king is not going to be able to solve this predicament uh, all on his own. So it is up to the politicians. Uh, the politicians have decided this is not the government that Malaysia should have. So it's up to the politicians to figure out what is the next government. And then Malaysians will decide if you're happy with that government. Well, thank you so much, uh, Shannon, for coming on to the show. That was The Straits Times' Malaysia Bureau Chief, Shannon Teo, live from Kuala Lumpur. Now, in other news, we are also watching the situation in Afghanistan, where the government has collapsed, the president has fled the country and the Taliban are in full control. Now, fire could be heard as hundreds of people were seen rushing into Kabul airport this morning trying to leave the country. It took the Taliban just over a week to take over the country after Afghan government forces quickly surrendered without the support of US forces. US President Joe Biden has defended his decision to withdraw troops, saying that an indefinite American presence was not an option. Meanwhile, an update on the COVID-19 situation here. A total of 53 new cases were confirmed today. 
Of the 48 cases that were locally transmitted, 39 are linked to previous cases and 9 are currently unlinked. There were also 5 imported infections. Now more details will be released tonight. And then on to an update on Singapore's vaccination drive. As at August 14th, more than 4.1 million people have completed the full vaccination regimen, including those who have received the shots recognised in WHO's emergency use listing. That translates to 75% of the population as indicated by the orange line here. Now, the blue line, 81% have received at least one dose. Meanwhile, in the Health Ministry's daily update last night, 443 cases are currently warded in hospital. Most are well and under observation. 32 patients require oxygen supplementation and 8 are in ICU. Now, with more people getting vaccinated and adequate healthcare resources to care for those with severe infection, experts say Singapore is on track to further ease restrictions this week. The COVID-19 Multi-Ministry Task Force had announced in the last press conference on August 6th that more easing will be allowed from this Thursday, August the 19th, if the situation remains under control. But experts noted that measures are not being lifted all at once. Measures like mandatory mask wearing and border controls will still help to minimise transmissions in the community. Now, to recap, some possible easing of measures will include events like worship services, subnizations, live performances and sports events may take place with up to 1,000 attendees if all are fully vaccinated. Work from home requirements will also be eased. Up to 50% of employees who are able to work from home will be allowed to return to the workplace. Now, further easing will also take place in preschools where parents of newly enrolled students may be able to enter the school's premises from Thursday. Preschools will still need to observe safe management measures such as only allowing one parent in a class to visit their child on a given day. The Early Childhood Development Agency added that the parent also needs to be fully vaccinated or has taken the ART before entry. Separately, the 16-year-old who suffered a cardiac arrest after his first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine is recovering steadily and has received $225,000 under the Vaccine Injury Financial Assistance Program. The Health Ministry said he is currently undergoing inpatient rehab and will likely be discharged in the coming weeks. The teen had suffered a cardiac arrest after developing myocarditis on July 3rd, six days after receiving his dose. MOH said the adverse event may have been aggravated by his strenuous lifting of weights and his high caffeine consumption through energy drinks and supplements. Over in Australia, Sydney recorded its deadliest day to day with seven deaths in the past 24 hours. And Melbourne residents face a nightly curfew on top of a further two weeks lockdown amid a surge in cases. Meanwhile, Japan is also set to extend its state of emergency lockdown to the middle of next month in regions including Tokyo. The current state of emergency is due to end on August 31st, but a continuing surge in cases has spurred calls to extend it. In other local headlines, a name search for Singapore First Born Panda Cup is underway with popular Mandarin names like Sin Sin and Le Le thrown into the mix. Some even suggested the name Chi Chi referring to the number 7 as the cup was born on the 7th day of the 7th month of the lunar calendar. It also happened to be during its parents Kai Kai and Tia Tia's seventh breeding season. Now Tia Tia and the cub are in an off-exhibit den to nurse and born and will be back for public viewing in about three months' time. Now, safe to say, we're all gearing up to pack our bags once travel resumes. So here's something you might notice the next time you board a Singapore Airlines flight. New choices on the menu. 
Boon Tong Kee's Chicken Rice, Beach Road Prawn Noodle and Bismillah Briyani Restaurant's Chicken Dam Briyani are just some of the hawker dishes on rotation in first and business class on some of its flights from September. It's part of SIA's efforts to increase the Singaporean flavour of its offerings and showcase the best of Singapore to its customers. Now those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Hariyan Tudiman. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.